Well, we do have this filing from uh, District Attorney Fonnie Willis uh, basically insisting on trying all 19 uh, defendants in the state of Georgia versus Donald Trump case together. She says the uh, state maintains that all the defendants shall be tried together. She stresses that the law favors trying all of the defendants together. She says, uh, Fonnie Willis says, the trial of 19 defendants would be feasible within the Fulton County Courthouse, whereas breaking this case up into multiple lengthy trials would create an enormous strain on the judicial resources of the Fulton County Superior Court. The state is capable of trying a large and complex case. For example, the Atlanta Public Schools case began with 35 defendants, 13 of which were eventually tried simultaneously. Uh, Fonnie Willis goes on to make the point that uh, should this court grant pending severance motions, a potential consequence could be a cascade of additional speedy trial demands emanating from the severed defendants. Each of those demands could spread out over the coming weeks, forcing the Fulton County court system to simultaneously accommodate three or more trials on the same facts before three or more sets of judges and juries, realistically holding three or more simultaneous high-profile trials would create a host of security issues and would create unavoidable burdens on witnesses and victims who would be forced to testify three or more times on the same set of facts in the same case. The uh, pleading goes on to make the point that the uh, possible appeals on uh, that Mark Meadows is making, uh, which we will discuss uh, also in a moment, uh, are moving very quickly so that those, those uh, appeals about moving the uh, trial to federal court uh, might be disposed of very, very quickly in this case. The Georgia case now is the biggest, most complicated case against Donald Trump, and it is moving faster than any other criminal case against Donald Trump, as tonight's filing and others show. And the federal courts intend to keep it moving fast, apparently. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals is rushing now to consider Mark Meadows' appeal of federal judge Steve C. Jones's decision refusing to allow Mark Meadows to move his trial to federal court. The 11th Circuit Federal Court of Appeals gave District Attorney Fawny Willis a deadline of noon tomorrow to file a reply to Mark Meadows' appeal, which includes a request that the progress of his case in the state court be paused while the federal appeals court is considering his appeal. But the speed with which the federal appeals court is responding could make a pause completely unnecessary. The federal appeals court is also asking the district attorney and Mark Meadows lawyers to address a very simple question about the federal law on moving a case to federal court, a question that has not come up before. The, the appeals court is asking the lawyers to answer this question. Does that statute permit former federal officers to remove state actions to federal court, or does it permit only current federal officers to remove? In a filing with federal district court Judge Jones, who denied Mark Meadows' motion to move his case to federal court, District Attorney Willis said that Mark Meadows was very unlikely to succeed in his appeal of uh, Judge Jones' ruling, and that the claim that Mark Meadows could be unfairly harmed by the case going to trial in state court before the federal appeals court rules was extremely unrealistic. District Attorney Willis said the defendant is already seeking expedited procedures on appeal and even the most optimistic timeline for his trial in this case would not see a verdict reached for months. Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyers have filed a series of motions 
based on the work of other lawyers in the case representing co-defendants. The Trump lawyers filed a motion to adopt co-defendant Giuliani's preliminary motion to quash and a motion to adopt co-defendant Chesbro's general demur to count one, along with a motion to adopt co-defendant Chesbro's motion to dismiss the indictment and a motion to adopt co-defendant Ray Smith's motion to quash indictment. Donald Trump's lawyers have indicated they might eventually file a motion to move his case to federal court. But by the time they do, it is possible that the federal appeals court will already have ruled on Mark Meadows' attempt to move the case to federal court. And so Donald Trump might not be able to create as much delay as he might have hoped with motions like this. Today, Fulton County Sheriff Patrick Labatt explain to NBC's Blaine Alexander why it was important for Donald Trump to be processed the same way everyone else arrested in Fulton County is processed. For me, it was understanding that, again, we, we have a community of black and brown people that uh, we have 3,600 detainees. 85 to 90 percent look like you and I, and they don't have that choice. We don't give them that choice. And they are simply accused of a crime as well. And so this accusation, this indictment, really at its highest level, I have a responsibility to our community to make sure that, that we are equal across the board and what that looks like. Have I received death threats because of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Leading off our discussion tonight is Glenn Kirshner, former federal prosecutor, and Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Both are MSNBC legal analysts. And Glenn, uh, let me get your reaction to this filing by Fawny Willis tonight, just within the last uh, hour, uh, saying, once again, all 19 defendants should be tried together. You know, she makes a powerful argument, Lawrence, and I have been skeptical, I think, as Many of my colleagues, including Joyce, have been uh, of the prospect of taking 19 co-defendants to trial at the same time. But I am beginning to be a convert because, as you emphasized in your opening, when I, I was just quickly reading through this motion, and she said if the court were to grant severance motions, it could result in a cascade of speedy trial demands forcing the Fulton County court system to simultaneously accommodate three or more trials on the same facts before three or more sets of judges and juries. And I have to tell you, the only thing more daunting than the prospect of trying 19 defendants at the same time is simultaneously trying three batches totaling 19 defendants at the same time. You need three sets of prosecutors, three juries, uh, three, you know, full complement of court security members. It really feels like it, it is perhaps the wiser and certainly the more economical approach to try all 19 together. And D.A. Willis has repeatedly insisted she can do it. She's ready to do it. And she is now highlighting to the judge why it is perhaps the best approach. Joyce Fitz, uh, what I can't understand uh even having gone through this filing, is how you can try all 19 together when some, very few so far, are asking for a speedy trial, demanding a speedy trial. It is their right. And others specifically asking not to have a speedy trial. Yeah, I think you've hit on precisely what's going on here, Lawrence, because like Glenn, I had questions about the wisdom of insisting that all 19 go to trial together. As you point out, some want a speedy trial, but others are bound to claim that they were forced to go to trial before they were ready, and that's a problem on appeal if there are convictions. So here's what Willis does in, in this uh, motion. Now we understand she doesn't really want the 19 to all go to trial together. Here's the deal that she wants. She says that these 17, many of whom are now coming in and filing motions to sever, are not giving up their speedy trial right act. So they could be severed, turn around and file a motion for a speedy trial. And that's how you would get this cascade where she might be having to try this same case three times simultaneously, 
three different courtrooms, same witnesses, but different defendants. So she's saying to the judge, look, you've got the right to demand that as a condition of granting severance, these defendants have to waive their right to ask for a speedy trial. And then she ends up with two groups, the two and perhaps 17, perhaps two smaller groups down the road. But there's not this problem of overlapping trials. Georgia has some real aberrational rules. Fonnie Willis understands them. This is a strong strategic move on her part. What is the difference between a real impeachment inquiry and whatever we can call happened today? Well, you know, I think the reality is uh, Lawrence uh, McCarthy realizes he doesn't have the votes to do a real impeachment investigation. He doesn't have the support of his own members to do it. Uh, but at the same time, his motivation is, what do I need to do to stay speaker one more day? or maybe one more week, uh, and he's got Donald Trump pushing him to do an impeachment inquiry. He's got the Marjorie Taylor Greens and Lee, Lee Stefanik's pushing him to do an impeachment uh, investigation. He knows he doesn't have the votes for it. He knows he's going to contradict himself from just two weeks ago. But, uh, but none of that really matters. Uh, and this is the problem he has with his own conference, and that is he stands for nothing. Uh, his only reason for being is to try to cling to that job. Uh, and he's being whipsawed, uh, in this case, by the Matt Gateses who are threatening to bring him down uh, and by others who are threatening to bring him down over the budget. Uh, and he's already reneged on the deal he made with Joe Biden on the budget. Uh, so he's going into this uh, confluence events where he's trying to throw some red meat to the base, give them an impeachment, uh, and at the same time, hang on to his job through this this budget uh, showdown at the end of the month. Let's listen to what uh, Carson Gates today said to the Speaker of the House, something that has never been said to a Democratic Speaker of the House. Let's listen to this. Mr. Speaker, you are out of compliance with the agreement that allowed you to assume this role. The path forward for the House of Representatives is to either bring you into immediate total compliance or remove you. So there's, uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy's boss, I guess, uh, on the floor of the House telling him he's going to get fired. Well, you know, Lawrence, at one level, these people deserve each other. Uh, there's no loyalty. There's no animating purpose. There's no real ideology here. Uh, in the case of Matt Gates, it's just uh, self-attention and to tear things down. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, it's just to cling on to that title for one more day. Uh, and, and this is why we are where we are. You know, the tragedy here is some of us are trying to find housing for people who are homeless and trying to bring down the cost of housing and to make health care more accessible and, you know, face the real challenges of the American people. But to Kevin McCarthy is, is fiddling um, while, while cities are burning from climate change, uh, and, uh, and instead of dealing with these real-world problems, uh, we have this complete degeneration of the House. The most rudimentary function uh, of the House is to keep the lights on and keep the government open. It's not even clear Kevin McCarthy can do that. He's trying to throw this impeachment sop to the right wing, uh, maybe to get past this uh, potential shutdown. But uh, the American people deserve so much better than what they're getting from this Republican majority. What does Vladimir Putin not understand about our criminal justice system? Well, thank you for having me, Lawrence. I think he doesn't understand anything about it. Or if he does, he's quite ready to turn it upside down. As Mr. Karamoza's mother said, it's the world turned upside down. Vladimir Putin is hardly the person to talk to us about how democracy should work. He uses the word democracy, but he means dictatorship. There is no evidence, not a scintilla of evidence, that the prosecutions that he claims are politically motivated against any of these defendants, including Donald Trump, 
no evidence that they were politically motivated. They were brought, particularly in the case of Jack Smith, by a career Republican, an independent most of the time, but certainly not a Democrat, not under the control of the Justice Department. He's suggesting, and he's actually saying, that a real democracy puts its leaders above the law. If you're a real democracy, you never prosecute those who hold the office of president. Well, that's convenient for him. It's convenient for the heads of other dictatorships like that in North Korea and China. And it would be convenient for Donald Trump. But it's the very opposite of democracy, which requires the rule of law. Constitutional democracy is not a free for all in which those who hold power uh, get to exercise it without limit. What he doesn't understand, therefore, is that when we say no one is above the law, we actually mean it. We live it. That's part of our creed. And the idea that this man who murders or imprisons for life, those people who dare criticize him, the idea that he should be telling us how to run our government is really appalling. And it's all connected with his aggressive plans for the world. It's not a coincidence that he made this speech in Vladivostok at the same time that he was criticizing American support and Western support for Ukraine. From the very beginning, he and Donald Trump and some of the other MAGA believers have been embracing one another in the bear hug to end all bear hugs, in which they say that Russia, despite having engaged in an illegal, aggressive war against Ukraine, annexing territory, committing atrocities, Russia is in the right and we are in the wrong, that we ought not to be supporting Ukraine, that Trump is the right guy to lead us because he would give dictators like Putin everything they want. And it's been clear from the beginning of his ascendancy to power in this country that Donald Trump's loyalty is not to America. It's not to our Constitution. It's not to the well-being of our people. It is either to his own well-being or that of the dictators whom he takes as his role models. They're all wrapped up in one another. And when they praise him for being a very stable genius, he praises them in turn for being really smart and really tough. I think we really are learning what Donald Trump and his movement is all about when we see who their friends are, when we see those who use them as models of what kind of country they want us to be. And that's what's at stake in the forthcoming period, whether through the prosecutions of Donald Trump by Fonnie Willis or by Jack Smith or by Alvin Bragg, or in the attempts by various people to make sure that if he is disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, that he is left off the ballot. What we are all about is enforcing the law, and democracy under law is the thing that Vladimir Putin cannot abide.